Well, we're going to turn to our time in the Word now, and believe it or not, as hard as it is to imagine, Resurrection Day has come and gone in the life of the, the church calendar year. You walk into your local Tesco or Sainsbury's or Asda, and they are putting everything, marking it down. You know, I don't know if any of you took advantage of that this week. I certainly had just this happy accident where I walked in and it was like 75% off, all the chocolate you can, Neil's shaking his head in the back, no, don't do it, uh, all the chocolate you can eat. And so uh, it's come and gone. And it is, uh, it, it, it's interesting to us that we are, the, the, my mouth isn't working, my brain's not working this morning, I'm sorry. It's interesting to me that as I get older, I recognize that the uh, the seems like the days are shorter, the years are shorter. We've already moved past Easter, and we're back moving towards summer. We're back in our Ephesians series, and today's message is, is entitled "Reconciled from Wrath." Uh, reconciled from wrath. That's a mouthful. And admittedly, uh, wrath, especially the wrath of God, isn't something we like to focus on. It's not a fun subject to think about. It's much easier to emphasize the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. Those are fun messages. Those are easy, happy messages. But we will never fully understand the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, unless we understand the wrath of God that comes along with it. God's wrath is a very real thing. And it's at the center of our passage today. And before we read, I want to share our main thought for you today. And this is kind of our summary statement. We're going to repeat it. Hopefully you come away with this in your heart and your mind. That apart from Jesus, you and I are under wrath. But in Christ, we can be free. Apart from Jesus, you and I are under wrath. But in Christ, we can be free. Our passage today is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. I invite you to turn there with me. If you have a hard copy or digital copy, it'll also be on the screen behind me. Let's read this together. Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient, we too all previously lived among them in our fresh, fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. This may sound really weird to you, but I love this passage. I love this section in Ephesians. I, it's one that I have cherished for years. I remember 22 or so years ago sitting in my living room um, just praying through this, meditating on this, trying to get it in my brain and memorize it. And that's because as serious as it is, this is a glorious passage. It speaks to the glory of God. In an incredible way, it offers us hope and freedom because of the serious things in it. And it's incredibly freeing in that it takes the burden of trying to measure up completely off of us. It helps us to see that I, my, my efforts to try to measure up are futile. My, my efforts to just try to live the right life in order to earn something with God are totally uh, they're nonsensical. I cannot do that. But thanks be to God, we have this passage. It tells us that apart from Christ, you and I are under wrath. But thanks be to God, in Christ, we can be free. These, these few verses tell us so much about the reality we live in. It sums up the human experience. If you go and study what theologians say about this passage, they say that the first half or so of, of uh, Ephesians 2, Paul is summarizing what he's written in the first three chapters of Romans, that he goes back and, and he kind of condenses it down. I don't know if you've read through Romans re uh, recently, but, but Paul goes to great lengths to help the reader understand the depth of the depravity of the human experience, of the human heart. 
Here he summarizes it a bit. And this passage is broken into two halves. There's the before and the after. Now, for some of us, the second half describes where we are. But here's the thing. Every one of us has had experience with that first half. Verse 1 very simply states the truth of where we find ourselves. Without exception, this either is or has been our story. The reality is that either you are, Uh, were or you currently still are dead in your sin. I was dead in my sin. There's no more graphic description of sin than this passage lays out for us. It pulls no punches. It doesn't try to soften the blow of the actuality of the state that we find ourselves. The situation we find ourselves in apart from Christ is one that is beyond what I would describe as dire. It's beyond what I would describe as tragic or desperate. The passage uses the word dead. Apart from Christ, we are spiritually dead. We're stillborn spiritually. From birth, you and I have lived this life as spiritual dead men and women. Unfortunately, I have had the experience of uh, losing several family members in years of uh, members and friends over the years, and there's always this deep sense of loss anytime you lose a loved one. Um, and and it, the loss seems to kind of go even, even deeper when it's a younger person who, who passes away. Uh, several years ago, Dean and I lost a pregnancy, and I just remember the aftermath of that, thinking through all the what might have been all the what could have been. And it wasn't just the loss of a loved one. It was the the loss of hopes and and dreams. And that really kind of frames what we're talking about this morning, that it feels absolutely tragic to lose a loved one. So for those of us for whom this is a more familiar passage, let that thought just kind of stir in your heart today that apart from Christ, that's our state. We are dead. That's where you and I either are or were before Jesus. And if that's the case, then let's just take a moment to to fully think through what that means for us. Consider what a dead person is able to do. The the use there is is deliberate. There's no sense in which Paul is trying to say that we lost a battle, so now that we died spiritually. No, there's no sense of, of fighting at all. You're dead. You can't do anything. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. We see that clearly from Psalm 51, verse 5. Let's take a a moment and look at Psalm 51 together because I want you to see that this isn't my opinion. This isn't just my, my, my thoughts about this passage. This is not my interpretations. This is straight up, as clear as day, the truth we find in God's Word. Read it with me. Psalm 51, One says, be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion, completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me against you. You alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. I don't have time to to do it here this morning, but if you do a deeper dive on verse 5, you'll see that both the context and the implications from the Hebrew, the language this was originally written in, it points to each of us being conceived in sin. Not in that we were conceived in a sinful act by our parents, but because we are born as sinners. From our birth, we are sinners. And that certainly lines up with what you see in Ephesians 2, verse 3, that says, We too previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath. Remember, God's standards for justice is that He would only carry out or unleash wrath in an instance where there is sin. So when you put these together, you see that we are born sinners. And this comes full circle when you consider what Paul tells us in Romans 6.23. He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
what we earn from sin is death. So if we're sinners from birth, then we are spiritually dead from birth. Listen to what pastor and commentator Kent Hughes says about this in his commentary on Ephesians. He says, death is not a figure of speech here. Paul means that they were absolutely dead. Moreover, though Paul speaks of Gentiles in verse 1, he includes his fellow Jews in verse 3. This state of spiritual death is universal. He's not describing some decadent, drugged out segment of society, but all of humanity from top to bottom. All people are dead apart from Christ. The bottom line here is when Paul says dead, he means it to have universal and absolute application, no exceptions. John Stott said this about the same subject, that we should not hesitate to reaffirm that a life without God, however physically fit and mentally alert the person may be, is a living death. And that those who live it are dead even while they are living. That means that the human experience apart from Christ is one of spiritual death. And this passage tells us that there are two ways that we're dead in our sins. One, that we are dead in our actions. First, it reveals that we're dead in our actions. So let's, let's look at verses 1 to 3 again. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclination of our flesh and thoughts. So all of us have sinned willfully through our actions. Paul says it this way in Romans 3, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that we have all missed the mark of God's standard, that we have willfully rebelled against God's ways. We've, we, we say it this way in our, in our, for our holiday club, that we have turned away from God's way and gone our way, that we have rebelled willfully. This isn't a one-time thing. It's a state of life. That's what verse 2 tells us, that you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked. We walked in this. We experienced it. Another way to render that word walk is live. We lived this out. Sinful action was the way in which we lived our lives. It was deliberate. Look at verse 2 again. Paul uses this word that, that's translated, he translates, or we translate, disobedient. And this could literally be translated as willful unbelief or obstinacy or disobedience. Make no mistake that this was not something we fell into by accident. I think that's the, the place we'd like to say, oh, this just kind of happened to me. This, this was not something that happened to us. You may say, but look at verse 2. Doesn't it say there that it was you know, the devil that made me do it? It was the, the, the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit working in the disobedient? Wasn't he the one who was manipulating us to, to, to sin? Um, as a species, we, we have a, a bad habit of passing the blame, starting from the beginning in the garden. Oh, Lord, it was the woman you created for me. Well, it was the snake who made me do it. It was the, you know, it, we pass the blame as a people. And while, yes, I'll stipulate that from the garden, Satan and his forces have been at work to steal, kill, and destroy, to try to tempt us from going God's way, you and I are still responsible for our actions. We're still responsible for willingly rebelling against God. We aren't the victims. We're the perpetrators here in this story. We willfully chose to go against God again and again and again, moment after moment day after day, year after year. And in so doing, what this passage says, we came under God's wrath. It was here that we lived. And for some of us today, it's where we still are. And if that's where you are today, know this, that apart from Jesus, you and I are under wrath. But in Christ, we can be free. We said that we're dead in our actions. Secondly, that we're dead in our nature. This passage tells us that we're dead in our very nature. As bad as it sounds to be under the wrath of God for, for the things that we do, 
the situation is oh so much worse than we could ever imagine. Look back at our passage. Verse 3 says this, that we all too lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. So it's not just that we do sinful things or carry out rebellious acts in our life against God. In our very nature, we are sinful. We sin because we are sinners in our heart, which means that we are dead in our nature. Remember, verse 2 tells us that we're disobedient. There's this willful component to it. That's, that's what the Greek kind of implies there, that, that we sin willfully because we are by nature willfully disobedient. So that means that every aspect of our lives are affected by this and permeated by this. If our very nature is sinful, then all that we do is affected. How we view life, how we view relationships, how we view money, how we view entertainment, even how we view the church. And you may say, I know a lot of people who are not followers of Jesus, and they, they're good people. They're, they're nice people. They're not bad people. And to that, I would simply respond that I didn't say we are as bad as we possibly can be. Uh, we could no doubt always find someone else who has run headlong into the pursuit of their sinful nature a little more so than we have. Or, or the, the way that that sin, the consequences of their sin manifest in their life is a little more public than, than maybe the consequences of the stuff that I hold on to. But that causes us to ask the question of what's our standard for gauging sinfulness? Is it looking around for other people to say, well, they're not as bad as me, I, I'm not as bad as them. Uh, I, I could always be like that person over there. It's, is it what society says, that society's standards? And I just have to say that society changes and shifts its moral standards more than Storm Kathleen winds were blowing yesterday, all right? Um, fairies were canceled yesterday, I heard. So, like, winds were crazy, storm was raging. That's the way society shifts and change frequently. There's only one standard that remains perfect. There's only one standard that remains stable, that doesn't change, and that's God's standard. I said earlier that Ephesians 2 is a summary of Romans 1 to 3, and, and there Paul quotes from Psalm 14. As he's laying out his case in, in Romans uh, there, he, he quotes from Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3, to make his point about the extent of our sin. He says, "...the Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise." one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. In comparison to God's perfect standard of good and justice, no one has succeeded in measuring up. None of us have. I haven't. You haven't. And because of that, apart from Jesus, you and I are under wrath. But in Jesus, we can be free. You're like, man, Easter was fun last week. It was happy. <laughs> happy songs and happy messages come the week after. Woo. Uh, so what does this mean for us? Don't worry. Good news is coming. All right. Hold on. What does that mean? Well, let's think about this. What can a per dead person do? We already kind of talked about this, but let's kind of play this out a little more. A dead person can't actually take action to affect their situation, right? They can't try harder to change their circumstances. They can't fight their way out of the situation. It's too late. They're dead. They're powerless to change things. In our sinful actions, in our sinful nature, as people who are under wrath, we were helpless. We were powerless to do anything to change our situation. And that's why it's such a big deal that Jesus came to this earth, that he, almighty God, would take on our flesh, that he would live a life of perfection, free of sin, free of in action and in nature, and then die for us, doing the thing for us that we can't actually do for ourselves See, if you go back to the, Bible, the beginning of the Bible, since the beginning of the Old Testament, you see that God's 
God gave a temporary way for God's people's sin to be covered over a short term. It was animal sacrifices, the blood of bulls, the blood of goats. It was, it was rituals to try to atone temporarily for sin. But when you consider what Paul says in Romans 3, that the wages of sin is death, what we know is that something has to die for sin. That, according to God's perfect standard of justice, something has to die for sin. The temporary solution was animal sacrifice in the Old Testament. People would sacrifice just to delay the wrath a bit, to cover over the wrath that was meant for them. And then we get to the New Testament, and we see that Jesus completely does away by that. He accomplishes this by atoning through his death on the cross. Because he had no sin in his actions and in his nature, he could take the place of all that stuff for thousands of years that had been happening, and one time for good, it was done. No more animal sacrifice needed. He became the perfect sacrifice for us. We saw that from, from, from Romans 6 a few minutes ago, that the wages of sin is what? It was death. That's right. So if Jesus never sinned, in action or nature, then why did he die? Well, consider this. For Jesus, dying on the cross was a willing choice, not an unfortunate outcome. It was a willing choice. Jesus, being perfect, died a death that bore the wrath that we deserved. He took that punishment upon himself for us. Think about that. The perfect one who had never incurred even the smallest measure of wrath from God, said, I'll take in an infinite amount of wrath upon myself for you, for me. When Jesus died on the cross, his death made a way to satisfy that penalty of God's wrath against sin permanently so that if we put faith in Jesus, if we trust in that sacrifice, the penalty of our sin it's done. If we trust in a way that turns from our sinful way, then it's paid for. And that leads us to the second half of our passage. Look at verse 3. It says, We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, who is rich in his mercy... Because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. We've heard the bad news today, and it is terrifying news apart from Christ. But here's where we see the good news that overshadows everything that we've looked at today. The good news is what we looked at last week. <laughs> we see here in this passage that the cross wasn't even the end of the story, as, as great as the cross is. And when we've looked at, at communion this morning of Jesus dying on the cross, of his body being broken, his blood being poured out, we could not be made alive, though, if Jesus wasn't raised because of what this passage says here. The work of Jesus on the cross took care of the wrath that we were under. It took care of the consequences of our sin. In a sense, it brought us up to zero in your bank account. It took that negative balance and brought it up to zero. It wiped the slate clean. The resurrection was the powerful working of God to actually undo the effects of the sin. The wages of sin is death. Well, the resurrection undid all of that wages of sin in my life and in your life. He took death away. He didn't just take the wrath of God away. He took death away itself. And so where the cross brought forgiveness, the resurrection brought life. When Christ rose from the dead, he ensured that now we can have eternal life. It's because of the resurrection that we know that we're saved. In verses 1 and verse 5 there, this passage says that we were dead. And without us looking to Jesus, we are spiritually dead. We're under wrath. But when we put faith in Jesus, we are brought to life spiritually. In John chapter 3, Jesus is talking with Nicodemus, one of the, the religious leaders of his day. And he has come to Jesus secretly under the cover of night because he doesn't want anybody to see, to see what's happening there. He doesn't want to be found out that he's talking to, to, uh, to Jesus. 
uh, who wasn't popular with the crowd that Nicodemus ran with. And in the course of their conversation, Jesus makes a reference to, to an Old Testament story back in Numbers chapter 21. And the people of God, as a punishment for their unwillingness to obey God, to go and take the land, they're like, nah, I don't think so. don't think we can do that. God punishes them by having them wander around the wilderness for 40 years. And that same people who didn't get to go into the promised land because of their choice, they get into this wandering around the desert and they begin to murmur and they begin to grumble about God. Not themselves, about God. God, this food you've given us every day faithfully in abundance, so tired of it. I know it's enough, but I'm so tired of this same thing. Water in the desert, trying to find water. God, you would not believe how hard this is. To begin to complain about the state in which they got themselves into. And so in their moaning about how hard it was, God in his just wrath sent poisonous snakes into their camp. And these snakes began to bite people and strike people. And they people were dying from snake bite. But at the same exact time, Moses, God commands Moses to go and to form a, 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 uh, you, it's not a statue, but a, a bronze serpent uh, and place it on a pole and to raise it up so that if anyone, when they're bitten by the snake, would look at that bronze serpent, they would be healed. They would be saved. And the people's looking to the serpent ensured that they would live. And this is exactly what putting faith in Jesus means. That it's that we realize that we are all like the people in the wilderness. That we've been bitten. That the poisonous effects of our sin is flowing through our veins, ready to kill us. It's only a matter of time before it does kill us. And the only thing that will save us today is if we will look our, raise our eyes and look to Jesus, the one who was raised up on the cross. And this is what Jesus tells Nicodemus as he relays this story in John 3, 14. He says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Apart from Jesus, you and I are under a wrath. But in Christ, we can be free. We've seen that apart from Christ, we're dead in our actions. We're dead in our nature. But thirdly today, we see that in Christ, we can be free because of the resurrection. Easter isn't just a story limited to the gospel accounts of the life of Jesus. The, the implications and the ramifications of what Jesus did, they ripple out throughout the rest of church history, throughout the rest of life. You see it in verses 4 and 5 of our passage. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, he made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. Because God is merciful, you can be free. His perfectly merciful and perfectly loving offer for you today is not to stay under wrath. Don't stay under wrath. It's to be reconciled to God. So if that's you today, if you know in your heart that things are not right, things are not okay with you and God, that you need to actually trust in Jesus, then you can do that today. You, you can't imagine the freedom that comes with that the peace that comes with it, the joy, the hope in following Jesus. And I invite you to come talk to me after our time of worship about that. But Christian, it's only because God is merciful that you are free. Amen? The amazing truth before us today is that God didn't have to do any of this. He didn't have to do any of this. He wasn't obligated to shower us with mercy and love. He wasn't obligated to save us by his grace. But because he is perfect, completely perfect in every way, 
he is, because he's good, because he's more loving than we can imagine, he made a way for us. As a follower of Jesus, our response to all of that should be awe and wonder. It should be living a life that strives to know and God more and to make much of him. You are now free. Do you live like you're free? Or do you fall back into those old traps of self-reliance? Do you live under the, ne- the unnecessary weight of legalism that, that acts as if your salvation hinges upon just how good you can be every moment of every day? Remember the freedom that's been purchased for you. Let that, that truth propel you toward living a life of devotion to the Lord. I'll close with, with this today. Most of the year, we have a team of folks that we prayed for just a minute ago. The team from First Baptist Pratt will come over and um, to do our help us do our ESOL camp in the afternoons. And, and this past summer, I, uh, as I plugged into that and was helping out with some of the beginners, because we break them up into different groups, the beginners and inter- intermediate, um, I was going over the concept of tenses, verbs, and how do you, you know, past, present, future going back to my childhood school days and trying to uh, remember how to, how to communicate all of that. And so if you remember back to your school days then and jog that memory, past tense, something that happened in the past. Present tense, something that's happening right now. Future tense, something that will happen in the future. Basic English, right? When we look at today's passage, I have to ask you, what tense are you living in? For Paul, writing to Christians, to people who had put faith in Jesus, who had trusted in the work that he did on the cross, he wrote in the past tense that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But maybe you're here today, and as you examine the actions of your life and your heart, you you can't help but recognize that for you this passage is still present tense. That as I talk about what it means to trust in Jesus, you recognize that there's never been a time in your life where you've done that. That you've never placed faith in a way that stakes your whole life upon him or never made him the king of your life. And I urge you not to run from that or to hide from that or to try to suppress that feeling of conviction in your heart. When I tell you that in Christ you can be free, That's what I'm talking about. You can be free. What it takes is recognizing this, turning from your way to God's way, telling God that he is what you want your life to be about. I would love to talk with you after the service if that's you. I'd love to pray with you. Come see me after the service if that's where you are. Christian, your life is tied to resurrection. Are you living in light of this freedom? It should propel us forward in in perseverance. It should make us delight in the freedom from wrath that we live in, causing us to boast in the Lord. It should affect our identity, knowing that we are securely His. doesn't matter what happened at work this week. doesn't matter what argument I had with my friend or my spouse. It doesn't matter... What bill I unexpectedly received in the post this week. My identity is secure in Christ. I'm no longer under wrath. I'm now one who is loved, who's cherished, who is a child. I am free. Friends, apart from Jesus, we are under wrath. But in Christ, we can be free. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of the gospel. The reality is that apart from you, Jesus, things are hopeless. We are under the wrath of God. But thank you that you made a way for us to be free. Help us to come around that, to to think about that. Lord, I pray for those here who may be thinking through following you and pondering this truth. Lord, I pray that you would give them clarity of thought. Help them to understand this. Help them to be bold and brave enough to to take the step of talking about it with others. I pray for those here who are followers of Jesus that you would bring a renewed sense of freedom to their hearts.
a renewed sense of awe and wonder because of what you have done in our lives. Help us to live like we saw the, the Thessalonians a moment ago, full of joy to the point that wherever we go, the word of the Lord rings out from us. Have your way in our hearts and lives today. In Jesus' name, amen.